Okay, looks like we're live here. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry, just got a nice voice from uh, from the Zoom uh, bots saying that recording was in progress. So that means we're live and uh, and welcome to another installment here uh, in the Hank Center's fall series, uh, fall season. Our event today is part of our Catholicism and Dialogue series, and it's called Conversations on Racial Justice. Uh, we're so glad you're here, Zoom community, uh, and that you're joining this this very important dialogue with this really wonderful um, group of people, scholars and thinkers. My name is Michael Murphy and I direct the Hank Center here at Loyola. And on uh, behalf of university leadership and on behalf of Joan and Bill Hank, whose generous endowment funds our many enterprises. This is the 15th year. So we're having a special Hank year. We, we welcome you and we thank the Hanks. So I'm extending a hearty welcome and a hearty greeting to all of our viewers and listeners, our friends, and of course, Joan and Bill, if you're on the call, uh, kind greetings and thank you very much. I'd also like to welcome you on behalf of our center staff, uh, our office manager, uh, Patty Delgado, and our grad assistant, Adam High. Um, before I hand it over to our session moderator, Dr. Mara Brecht, I'd just like to say a personal thank you to our superb panel uh, for saying yes to our invitation. Rabbi Michal Wohl, Pastor Chris Harris, Chaplain Omar Mosafar, and our friend from the Baha'i community, Mr. Steve Sarowitz. Deep gratitude to you all. And I've really enjoyed our correspondences these last months, and of course, our conversation in the green room just now. So um, thank you again. And thank you, Mara, for agreeing to both facilitate and enter into the conversation. Uh, let, me, let me briefly introduce our, facil uh, our facilitator to our Zoom community, and that's Dr. Mara Brecht, who is a, an associate professor of theology here at Loyola. Uh, and her research interests are in the areas of Christian faith formation in contexts of diversity, racial and religious. Her first book was Virtue and Dialogue from 2014. Her second book, uh, Comparative Theology in the Millennial Classroom was from uh, 2016. Uh, it investigates how the culturally hybrid identity of millennial students shapes their engagement with religious others, uh, in quotes, on campus, and of course, in the classroom. Uh, Dr. Breck's current project argues that responsible Christian interreligious engagement must take racialized categories of belonging into account and acknowledge the close historic ties between whiteness and Christian belonging. So we have one more thing, you know, because um, this summer I came across my radar when I was at the College Theolo Theology Society's meeting. Uh, Mara won the, the very prestigious award, uh, the Monica Helwig Award, which is a teaching award. And when I mentioned to, to Mara, she was she, she paused. It, it meant a lot to her. And I want to make it known that Mara won the award and recognize, you know, what a what an achievement that is. So congratulations, Mara, and welcome to our midst. Thanks for saying yes to our invitation. Good luck to all, thank you. Thanks for your generous introduction, Mike. Uh, thank you for all for being with us who are close or afar. Um, 
If you're in Chicago, you know we've gone from August to November. Uh, so I'm wearing a jacket for the first time in months. Um, I hope you're comfortable and are ready to engage in, I'm sure, really rich and spiritually nourishing, intellectually nourishing dialogue. As Mike said, I'm a professor of theology and my interest um, as a person of faith myself and as a teacher is to think about the ways in which I'm shaped and formed by people who are different than me. When I wrote my dissertation, I had the opportunity to interview women um, who were engaged in an interreligious dialogue community for 10 or so years. And it was profound to me the ways in which their um, home faith was strengthened and not challenged um, or undermined, challenged in the sense of undermined through engaging with people who are different than them. And as I've kind of progressed in my years of teaching, I've become um, more attentive to my own social location, um, thinking about who I am as a white Catholic Christian and how I'm shaped by people who have different racialized and religious identities. So I have a lot to learn today from the people that we're in dialogue with, and I look forward to this conversation. Uh, how I will see myself today is really as a, uh, a conversation prodder and maybe a traffic director. So I'll just, I'm hoping to kind of put people in conversation with one another and not do too much of the heavy lifting myself. My heavy lifting will be happening um, in my own head as I'm jotting down notes here and learning along with everyone. The way that we're going to begin is by asking each of the dialogue participants to just introduce themselves. And um, we, we hope that we hear from each of our participants kind of a bird's eye perspective on how they view the, the really complicated complex of race, racism, racial justice, and of course, to also think about reconciliation. Um, I'm sure as they talk about how their home traditions use this complex, we'll also hear a little bit about their own uh, stories of faith, their own perspectives of faith. And then we will move into a discussion that will involve questions that I've kind of um, formulated as well as ones that I've drawn together from folks in the audience who've already sent their thoughts and comments in. You're also invited to write comments into the chat through Zoom and Mike and I are gonna be paying attention to those as much as we can and we'll try to um, stir them into the mix of dialogue that we have here as we go. You can direct them to either me, pardon me Mara, or Mara and we'll field them. Thanks so much. Um, so with that in mind, I would like to just turn it over to um, our group. And as I do with students who I teach, I always say, like, we're going to do a popcorn thing whenever when everybody, somebody is ready to pop up and offer their perspective. Um, and we'll just kind of move in that way until we hear from each of the four participants. And then we'll move to a little bit more directed questions. So if I can turn it over to my colleagues here. Sure, I guess I can jump in. So uh, my name is Omar. I am the Muslim chaplain here at Loyola, and I am thankful both to be in part of part of this esteemed panel and in this discussion. Uh, speaking about about the the idea, the practice, the consequences of race, a couple of points that I have to begin with. First and foremost, this is global. Uh, when I'm usually speaking about race and racism, I'm speaking about white supremacy, and white supremacy is a global experience. Uh, and a simple example of that is we can be in places in South America, we can be in Sub-Saharan Africa, we can be in the Indian subcontinent, and there will be many who will find light skin to be something more beautiful, and in Western European features to be more beautiful and thus given more esteem than those uh, we would consider to be more, more native or more indigenous. And some of that relates to the American marketing machine but this precedes America. This goes back at least to the 1500s, some traces back to Hieronymus Bosch and his, his famous painting, The Garden of Earthly Delights. And so that's the first point, that this is global and this is connected not just to theology, but to business. But in the context of theology, when we are speaking of white supremacy, we are defining not just the issue of color, but we are defining what does it mean to be a human? that when we are speaking of white supremacy, we can put people of color in every single position of leadership, of every single position of representation, and the system will still be a white supremacist system because that is still considered to be the default. That is considered to be the condition without flavor. And thus, if someone has something different, whether it is a different religion from, from the Protestant outlook or a different, uh, a different gender or 
anything else that's either considered to be a flaw or a flavor. And so then how do we respond to this? This has to be an all pronged response involving all of us together because it's in every corner of the globe. Now within the Islamic paradigm, uh, uh, issues are addressed through a combination of theology as well as with law. All of this gets traced back to the primary sources and one passage in the Quran is often invoked in this context where the divine is being quoted as saying that he has created us in tribes and colors so that we get to know each other not so that we get distant from each other. And then in the prophet Muhammad, may peace be upon him, in his final public sermon, he makes a statement saying, the black of you is not superior over the white and the white is not superior over the black. And what's interesting is that in that society, the term black was associated with being an elite. Like the term Sayyid Su'ada, uh, that was actually, the word literally translates as black, but it would be something like we, what we would translate as honorable. And so it begins with those primary sources. And then in terms of theology, by the point I'm making about, about white supremacy in defining what is the human, it means that we have to reassert definitions of the human. To be inclusive in matters that past generations used to take for granted, but now it has to be asserted. And what this also then means is that in defining the human, we're also saying that my well-being is based upon your well-being. My well-being is based upon the well-being of the neighbor, of the stranger. And if the neighbor or the stranger is suffering or is being forced to suffer, then by definition, I am suffering or I am the one who is causing suffering. That would be more in the realm of theology. In the realm of law, it relates more to who is considered equal in terms of justice. And again, this is something that has to get reasserted in our, in our, in our modern era, that everyone has to be equal in the matters of justice. And so, so in terms of my personal experiences, I, I live, I grew up in the South Side, not too far from where Pastor Chris actually serves, but I live in, in Orland Park and the Klan actively recruits where I live, right? And so for the Klan, I'm the other, right? For the Klan, I'm potentially not even a human. And so, so in terms of this engagement, it, what's interesting is that after 9-11, you know, in the Muslim community, we received a lot of, of calls to address terrorism. And so from now within the Muslim community, we're calling on the Christian community to, to address this problem of, of white supremacy. But even then, I'm saying that all of us have to do it together because all of us have to then uh, uh, figure out how to redefine everything. But those would be some initial com uh, uh, comments to get the conversation going. So thank you very much for your time. I will step in. Um, welcome everyone. My name is Rabbi Mikhail Wall. I live up in Milwaukee, but I have to claim my Chicago credibility. I'm a Skokie girl. It's a very stereotypical Jewish story growing up in Skokie. And my regular biking route included both the Baha'i Temple and Loyola uh, Lakeshore campus. So I'm, I'm just placing myself right in the middle of y'all. Um, I am affiliated with a movement called Reconstructionist Judaism. It is the, the youngest US, the youngest of the, the major four. Many will only be familiar with the major three. Um, but we are the first US born and bred movement. And part of the reason for our existence is because Judaism now needed to work in a place where Jews were not necessarily the oppressed other, and were now part of a community, which up until then, Jews had not been. So being a Jew discussing racism is profoundly complex. If you go to our texts, and our texts of thousands, are thousands of years older than the other texts in the room, so to speak, race was not understood. This was truly all tribal nation. I mean, one, it wasn't one, one world and one God, it was one nation and one God. So you were your people, you had your God, and the entirety of Torah comes from, and Torah and the entire you know, Hebrew Bible really comes from that perspective. That said, you know, it's, we know that there were good nations and there were not so good nations. And the you know, Western European white Christian colonial project in some ways was based on the taking of, of Israel in 
in uh, the book of Joshua. But I really believe that a few thousand years of human evolution should have uh, should improve things. The other piece about Reconstructionist Judaism is that we're really clear that Judaism is what Jews do. So it, we can't just point to some text or a prayer or a piece of Talmudic rabbinic interpretation to say this is what Judaism says about about anything. Judaism, Judaism doesn't say anything about anything. So what do Jews do about race? They struggle. And there's such a diversity within the Jewish community. At, at the core, Jews who want to engage in the work of being anti-racist simply point to the foundational verse that I suspect that my Christian colleagues um, lift up as well, which is B'Selem Elohim in the image of God. The beginning of the Bible for both Christians and Jews say that there was one humanity created and every human is created in the image of God. And so ignoring thousands of years of development and evolution and politics, we can reach back and say, this was the intention that we are all humans and we are all in the image and therefore we are all equally deserving of all of the good things that uh, the world and society should have to offer. And indeed Torah is really about creating a better society than had created before. That's very egalitarian. Let's ignore the gender piece. We're never gonna fix that. Humans have evolved. Um, and acknowledging all of those who choose to be part of this community, regardless of their background. Um, it's also often rendered as the ger toshav, the, the other, the stranger who is living among you should be welcomed in. And the, core story of, of our Torah is leaving Egypt, leaving slavery, where we were the oppressed other and creating a society that was different. Of course, we know that the world, things did not go well. And here now in the US, as a Jew, it is absolutely perplexing. Do I have white privilege? Absolutely. Do the vast majority of my Jewish community here in Milwaukee have white privilege? Absolutely. Do they, do they realize it? Maybe. And yet we don't have to go back to the Holocaust to think about Charlottesville and having white men carry torches saying Jews will not replace us. So Jews are white, except when they're not white. And when I bring my community together, which is a fairly progressive um, group of, you know, our, our typical is a 60, 70 something uh, progressive um, empty nester. And I start talking about racism, people are telling stories about their parents not being able to buy houses because of redlining. So finding our place in the story is really complex and yet, for those in the Jewish community who want to reach back into Torah and into our foundational values and say, we are all created in God's image and, and we work to do that. And there's a lot of history of the black and Jewish communities is sort of like the two most, no, no, called out communities. No, no dogs, no Jews, no blacks, right? Sadly around here now it's, you know, I can bring my dog to most places. And the last thing I want to say is that there's the, the elephant in the room, which is Israel, which is very complicated. Um, if you were to look at Israel and take away the Jewish overtone, it does not look very different than the United States does. It was founded on white, by white European Jews. And just like in the US, white European males do better. So there's a lot of work to do here and there. And uh, I will stop there. And uh, I'm so grateful to be here. Thank you. I'll, I'll go next. Um, so 
My name is Steve Sarowitz. I'm an entrepreneur and a philanthropist, and I'm a Baha'i. Uh, Baha'i faith has no clergy, so I'm representing the Baha'i faith as a member of the Baha'i faith. I uh, was raised Jewish and became a Baha'i six years ago. Uh, the Baha'i faith has a lot to say about racism. The Baha'i faith is the newest uh, world religion. And uh, in July 22nd of 2020, the Universal House of Justice, which is the highest uh, body of the Baha'i faith, came out with a letter to the Baha'is of, of the United States. And I'd like to quote from that letter. It says that racism is a profound deviation from the standard of true morality. It, de it deprives a portion of humanity of the opportunity to cultivate and express the full range of their capability and to live a meaningful and flourishing life while blighting the progress of the rest of humankind. It cannot be rooted out by contest and conflict. It must be supplanted by the establishment of just relationships among individuals, communities, and institutions of society that will uplift all and will not designate anyone as other. The change required is not merely social and economic, but above all, moral and spiritual. Within the context of the framework governing your activities, it is necessary to carefully examine the forces unfolding around you to determine where your energies might reinforce the most promising initiatives. The letter goes on to say, ultimately, the power to transform the world is affected by love, love originating from the relationship with the divine, love ablaze among members of a community, love extended without restriction to every human being. Racism has been in the Baha'i faith for a long, long time. Uh, nearly a hundred years ago, Shoghi Effendi, the guardian of the Baha'i faith, the worldwide leader at the time, wrote this. As to racial prejudice, the corrosion of which for well nigh a century has bitten into the fiber and attacked the whole social structure of American society, it should be regarded as constituting the most vital and challenging issue confronting the Baha'i community at the present stage of its evolution. The ceaseless exertions which this issue of paramount importance calls for, the sacrifices it must impose, the care and vigilance it demands, the moral courage and fortitude it requires, the tact and sympathy it necessitates, invest this problem with an urgency and importance that cannot be overestimated. And over a hundred years ago, Abdul Baha came to this country. He was the son of Baha'u'llah, the founder of the faith. Um, this is a quote from him, uh, from a speech he gave in Paris in 1911. He said, behold a beautiful garden full of flowers, shrubs and trees. Each flower has a different charm, a peculiar beauty, its own delicious perfume and beautiful color. The trees too. How varied are they in size and growth and foliage and what different fruits they bear. Yet all these flowers, shrubs and trees spring from the self same earth. The same sun shines upon them and the same clouds give them rain. So it is with humanity. It is made up of many races and its people are of different color, white, black, yellow, brown and red. But they all come from the same God and all are servants to him. The diversity among the children of men has unhappily, has unhappily not the same effect as it has among the vegetable creation, where the spirit shown is more harmonious. Among men exists the diversity of animosity, and it is this that causes war and hatred among the different nations of the world. I want to thank my fellow panel, uh, panel members for, for your insights thus far. I'm looking forward to hearing my friend Chris's uh, insights, as always. Um, as a Baha'i, I believe that there's only one God. There's not a Christian God, there's not a Muslim God, there's not a Jewish God, and there's not a Baha'i God. There's one God, we're all his children, and we're all hopefully trying to serve him. And may we serve him together and in peace. So let me say um, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so very much for having me today. I am uh, just truly, truly humbled to be 
a part of this panel, such an esteemed panel, and I'm already blessed by the various things that I have heard thus far. Uh, and uh, let me just say, I'm the pastor, Chris Harris is my name, I'm the pastor of two Pentecostal Church of God in Christ churches, uh, Bright Star Church Chicago in the Bronzeville area. And as, uh, as of June 29th of this year, I'm the pastor of a second church, St. James Church Chicago in the West Pullman Roseland area. I'm also the founder and CEO of Bright Star Community Outreach, which is a separate um, social services agency where we uh, serve in our community as it relates to uh, counseling, mentorship, parenting, workforce development, and advocacy in our community. Racism. Uh, I am always triggered in these conversations. Uh, let me say it again. I am always triggered in these conversations. And to be very frank with you, I'm sick of them because the reality is I think any black person since 2020, which is what I believe is the new cuss word, you don't have to cuss, just say, I don't give a 2020. I think everybody understands exactly what you mean. Black people deserve hazard pay because they've been essential workers for educating white people about black stuff constantly, as if white people didn't know. You know, it's interesting to me that through a Varna study in 2019, 38% of white practicing Christians did not believe that our country has a race problem. Let me say it again. 38% of practicing white Christians do not think that we have a race problem. Let's go further. What's even more shocking to me is the fact that only 78% of black Christians perceive a race problem. Which says to me that everybody's experience is not the same. You know, we always like to get these wonderful Christian and faith field statements like we're all in the same storm. No, we're not. Because here's the reality. If we're in the storm and I'm on a canoe and you're on a yacht, it's not the same storm. It's a very different experience. And we have to ask ourselves when it comes to our faith, it is in Micah chapter six, verse eight. In the King James Version, it says, he hath shown thee, O man, what is good. And what doth the Lord require of thee, but to do justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with thy God. I'm always sick of these conversations because the question is, how will we walk after this talk? I often say, say nothing about racism and inequality until you do something about racism and inequality. I got to tell you, it's challenging. It's tough. It's frustrating because a lot of people know that racism exists and we want to ignore the disparities. But the problem is last year, George Floyd's public execution and the fact that all of us were incarcerated to sit in our homes because of a pandemic had to watch this video play over and over and over and over again of what we conveniently ignored for all of these years and these kinds of things are tough to deal with and what we face right now is the challenge of Compassion fatigue. Oh, they arrested Chauvin. Isn't that good enough for you, Black people? It's kind of the same thing as, oh, you guys finally got Obama. Isn't that good enough for you, Black people? And just think about it. My grandmother, my grandfather, my great-grandmother, my great-grandfather, and my mother and my father told me about the horrible atrocities that they had to face, live through, and escape when it comes to slavery and Jim Crow. And just 48 hours ago, we witnessed the rewinding of the tape 
with white men on horses and whips, beating Haitians who are black people. Same thing, nothing has changed. And we have to ask our question, is Dr. King's dream now a nightmare? And what will we do about it? Oh, we know the disparities, we know the challenges. You know, for example, disparities that begin at birth. Black women are three to four times more likely to die from pregnancy related causes than white women. Oh, we know the issues. Yeah, black households are two and a half times more likely to experience food insecurity than white households. We know the challenges. Less than a third of black students attain a bachelor's degree or higher compared to almost half of white students. Or think about this, black undergraduate students owe about $7,000 more in student loans on average than their white peers after graduation. Black adults are more than 1.5 times less likely to have health insurance than white adults. All the challenges continue, this injustice. On average, black male offenders received federal sentences almost 20% longer than white male offenders for the same exact crime. Mm. In 2016, one of every 13 black people lost their right to vote due to a felony conviction compared to one in every 56 non-black voters. Black families have one-tenth of the median net worth than white families have. A black family is about half as likely to own their home as a white family. And black households nearing retirement have a median savings of $30,000, which amounts to one quarter of the amount held by white households. Black men have a life expectancy of 72.2 years more than four years less than white men at 76.6. These are issues, we know them well, but are we willing and ready to grapple and not only talk it, but walk people to a place of justice and equality? I close with these words. It was Dr. Martin Luther King who said it best. Not only a great prolific preacher, but also one of the greatest social justice champions that ever walked the face of this earth. He said, in the end, we will remember not the words of our enemies, but the silence of our friends. And I challenge every single person that is listening to us today with these words. How will you walk after today's talk? I'm looking forward to this conversation. Thank you all for um, the your contributions. Uh, thank you, Chris, for the stark and desperate picture that you've painted us um, with regard to racial injustice, um, not only in our uh, US context, but as Omar has pointed out, in the global context as well. Um, the, there are so many directions that I can imagine us um, lifting forward from these introductory statements, but I think I want to kind of drill down a little further here, um, right at the place Chris has left us. So everybody um, kind of introduced some resources in their tradition, some places, primary places where their home traditions um, have a, a very clear statement on who humans are, how they've been created, and who they're meant to be. Right, which is to say um, people without division, without subordination in the image and likeness of God. Um, this is depicted in various ways across traditions. One of the uh, things that has been most powerful for me um, as somebody who studied feminist theory and feminist scholarship is the way in which feminists recommend that we should always have a critical and appreciative engagement with whatever sources we're looking at. We should be able to um, find um, charitably places to celebrate and also to bring a critical edge and, and cut through the problems and um, 
complexes that we see with them. So what I'd like to ask the participants to reflect on is to um, think about that kind of double engagement with their own home traditions. So it's possible to both celebrate the way our home traditions advance racial justice or have a vision of racial justice, at the same time lamenting the ways our traditions have failed and, and how we have failed in our traditions and allowed uh, perpetuated injustice. So I, the, the kind of challenging and concrete question I'd like to pose to the panelists is, can you ex discuss a couple of examples, one or two ways um, of your own double critical and appreciative engagement? And, and I mean this, I guess, personally, like how do you personally doubly engage with your tradition with regard to racial injustice? Where do you see the places to celebrate? Where do you see the failures? I don't mind starting. Listen, black people live it, right? Let's just start with that. We live it. And of course we talk about it. And then after that, we pray about it. And I think it's vitally important that we understand that unless it is a lived experience, it may not have that top shelf listing of priority. Unless faith drives you, love drives you, unless compassion drives you to say what affects my brother and my sister or let me say it another way what affects my brother from another mother or my sister from another mister unless what affects someone who doesn't live like me and look like me matter to me then it will not matter uh even in the christian faith it is a very true fact that the most segregated time of any week is Sunday morning, where blacks worship with blacks and whites worship with whites. Well, at the church, usually somebody's going to eat. So blacks go and eat with blacks and whites go and eat with blacks. And it is highly unlikely that the white table is gonna discuss black issues, except through eyes of judgment. Well, like Dr. King said on the plane, a white man says to him, Dr. King, I hear your speeches, but why don't you tell your people to pull themselves up by their own bootstraps? And Dr. King strategically and methodically responded by saying, it is a cruel just to ask a bootless man and a bootless people to pull themselves up by their own bootstraps. The reality is, I think, until we begin to talk about each other's issues through the lens that God sees us, through the lens of compassion, then we won't start to help to address and be part of the effort of systemic change that racism and inequality is causing, especially toward black people. Yeah, uh, I'll, I'll piggyback back off of Pastor Chris, essentially saying the same thing, perhaps not as eloquently, but if there's injustice in society, then that means the tradition has failed, right? No matter how many wonderful things I quote, if we have racism in society, then the tradition is failing. That's basically what it all comes down to, that uh, the theology can be something that is beautiful, it is elegant, you know, and it makes sense. But if it does not translate into action, and if the action does not translate to change, and the change is not something that is benefiting people, then it has failed. Right? And so thus, I am saying that contemporary Islam in America is a failed exercise for this exact reason. Uh, that we have such sufficient injustice. I mean, I, uh, uh, as my students will tell you, if we only look at the resources that are in the Muslim community in Chicago, we can remove homeless, homelessness in Chicago. We can remove hunger in Chicago. But what is also taking place is, you know, I mentioned that this is a global phenomenon and that it's not remotely to dismiss or to even decrease the experience of the Black American that many of the Muslims who've migrated uh, to, to the United States, especially in the past 50 years, have sort of fallen into buying into white supremacy and seeking acceptance by way of white supremacy, by way of seeking success professionally, right? And, and about a third of, of the Muslim population in, in America is African-American. And in fact, the South Side of Chicago is one of the hearts of that uh, historically. And what should have happened uh, is it should have been a merger between the two populations but instead that did not happen. And so this, these are literally the, the types of questions and issues that I, that I 
literally dedicate myself to. So let others take it from there. I'll I'll jump in. Thank you. Um, I've I've already alluded to the fact that uh, it's the the Jewish community in some ways is is challenged and confused. I don't want to confuse. It sounds that sounds too weak. It's just even as we are a people, and once again realizing that the Jewish community is you know so broad, um, and I, I I think I'm I'm mostly speaking from the non-orthodox. Um, what you could call liberal, which is not saying it's progressive, but the non-orthodox community, which is still the majority here in the U.S. Um, and worldwide. And I feel like I'm a really in a really good place to see this because if there is a group of Jews who are ready to address this, it would be the folks who um, I I hang with, right? Truly, the most the most progressive. And so it's really interesting that being the oldest tradition in some ways we are still a very a, a very um isolated tradition and an isolated people because we've been forced to isolate for so long you know in christian lands and muslim lands you know across the ocean the Jew, jews were forced into their to be in their own communities so i think i'm of a generation to really see this huge shift um, and being part of a world where people would still look at lists of names and look for the Katzes and the Levines and the Levi's and the Cohen's to say, oh, who's Jewish? Because you could do that. You can't do that anymore between intermarriage, which uh, I'm, inter I'm an intermarried rabbi. This is, you know, <laughs> I do not talk about intermarriage is like the big problem in the Jewish world. Um, adoption, conversion, you no, know, the Jewish world looks very different. And it is really only now in the last decade that uh, the Jewish world is really being called to say, look at you. You don't look the way you used to look. Um, but so many folks are used to being in our own bubble of mostly European descended white Jews that in some ways we're, we're as challenged in, internally to like understand our own community now um, more so than we are to looking out in the world. And, and the Jewish world tends to carry that idea of you know, being there. I'll tell you, poor Abraham Joshua Heschel of blessed memory is holding up the entire Jewish world and this idea of being this anti-racist, justice-oriented people. Um, and I agree that if that was the case, um, with all of the, the tropes about Jews controlling the money, we don't. But we are a fairly wealthy community and we could also put every person into a home and um, into a school. So there, we, know, we know the work that there is to do and it is so generational in the Jewish world because the trauma is still fresh in you know the generation that I serve. So I um, am a philanthropist, as I mentioned when I uh, started, and I do a lot of work trying to help many communities. My biggest area is anti-racism. I should mention because the rabbi mentioned that she's an inner, uh, inner religious or inner. Uh, I'm an inner my my. I'm married to a Catholic woman who's Honduran who's. Uh, part Hispanic, part black. So I am actually the only white person in my family. Um, I would fight for black people anyway, um, as a Baha'i. Uh, but as you all said, all three of you have said that your faiths have failed, my faith has failed. And I don't look at that as a failure of Islam or a failure of, of Christianity or a fail, failure of Judaism. And I don't look at it as a failure of the Baha'i faith. All the faiths when, when done correctly are perfect. And the Baha'i faith is just the same, but there's a failure by Baha'is. And one of the things I've done personally is I have funded a woman by the name of Barbara Talley who does a beautiful thing called Pupil of the Eye. Um, the Baha'i faith, as I mentioned, is the newest faith and has a tremendous, tremendous amount of teaching about racism. It's really a treasure trove of beautiful teachings that are very effective when applied. And unfortunately, 
uh, we don't always apply them. And unfortunately, Baha'is like me are steeped because we are all steeped, including black people in this country, in racism. We're born in this soup of racism. We're born in this teaching, this white supremacist, as, as Omer uh, mentioned, uh, this white supremacist mentality that says Chris isn't as good as me. And, and, and it's, it's wrong. It's a lie. But we, we, we are all born into this and we all need to fight it. And we used, we all have to join together in all of our traditions to fight it. Um, so what Barbara Talley has done is, is built this incredible network among black Baha'is who've been hurt by well-meeting white Baha'is who were steeped in a racist tradition. And we're also working on a, a group together uh, where I'll be speaking in December, uh, where we're coming together, white and black, from this black only area. Because honestly, as as uh, as Pastor Chris mentioned, uh, there's so much trauma in the black community. People need to recover from that trauma, black people. And so in every faith, there has to be a place, a safe place for black people. Because, you know, and I would say in my, as a Baha'i, I've done a lot more, uh, many, many more interracial uh, race amity meetings. That's a lot of what I do. Um, the other thing that I do is a lot of impact investing with my family. And I think we have to put our money where our mouths are. And so um, I, I've invested in scholarships and education and building centers, doing whatever I can. And it's never enough to try and, and take this world, as Chris mentioned, where black people, you know, as he said, as all of us have said, we're all equal in the eyes of God. Every one of the four of us said that we're all equal in the eyes of God, but we do not act that way. The reason why we need the Black Lives Matters signs on our yards is because we act as if they don't. And we need to not just put a sign up in our yard, but to put a sign up in everything we do and, and live our face, each one of us, to the greatest extent that we can do to right these wrongs. To not say to, as, as Chris mentioned, you know, the Martin Luther King, pull yourself up by your bootstraps when there are no boots, but to offer the boots. And not only offer the boots, but to treat black people and all people who have never who have not been given a fair chance as full human beings, as partners in this enterprise, to make everyone equal in society and to give them the opportunities and to invest in opportunities and make it a and a big last thing I'll say is make it a priority. Um, when I first became a Baha'i, not too long thereafter. I went to a prominent black businessman and it, who said to me, great, you're doing all this stuff. You're giving to uh, charities, to, to nonprofits that help black people. He said, do you have a black accountant? Do you have a black lawyer? Do you have a blank banker? And my face got redder and redder as he asked me and he knew. And, and I, I've since rectified a lot of that on purpose and, and worked to get people on our board, worked in every way I can. I'm, I fall short every day. I'm an imperfect human being. But I do my best, I try my best to make the world a better place and to live my faith and to take these teachings and work side by side with wonderful people like Pastor Harris to make the world a better place. Um, on this point about kind of the mechanics of making anti-racist work a priority, um, uh, how do I wanna say this? In the fall semester of last year, I taught a course, a graduate seminar on critical philosophies and theologies of race and privilege. And the load was so heavy. The work was just, it was so heavy and so hard. And of course it was happening during pandemic year and all of these things. Um, and I and the students with me, we often felt like, where do, like, where do we turn <laughs> given um, how we have, our reckoning with this, like what, what are we going to turn to, to nourish ourselves? And I was so fortunate to have a class full of um, Jesuit men in formation and how many times they went back to the spiritual exercises of Ignatius of Loyola. So that is kind of the question I want to put to you all right now, which is what are the um, traditions that the spiritual disciplines and practices, uh, not necessarily what the sources say, but what is the spiritual kind of work that you do or people in your community Community do that sustain you, that nourish you as you do anti-racist work, or that you would recommend to um, other members of your tradition to help transform them 
to um, open their hearts and eyes to see the racial injustice in our world. So if, if we can just spend a little bit of time thinking about um, disciplines and practices, I would love to hear that. And I'm sure everyone else would as well. So I don't mind jumping out there. Uh, I just put some stuff in the chat. If um, there's some books that I'd like to encourage people to read if they wanna get informed, um, there's quite a few that are there. Uh, but I think the first thing is, you know, the scripture that says we perish for the lack of knowledge. And so one of the spiritual disciplines, and I tell our people to study, read, educate themselves. Uh, I think one of the greatest challenges uh, of this generation is they didn't have to fight to get to where they are. So there is a level of ignorance that uh, sometimes produces misguided passion. And my encouragement uh, to this younger generation is look at what the matriarchs and patriarchs have done. Uh, I think the, the pulpit has to do that. The preacher has to do that, right? Uh, I think some of the other traditions are having these conversations at the dinner table. Uh, let me tell you, my, my younger children, they're different. They're like, listen, we are not our grandparents. We ain't putting up with what they put up with. We're not dealing with what they put up with. And somebody's going to get hurt. That's just how raw they are. We are sick of talking to racist people. We're sick of hearing this Christian turn the other cheek. Let me tell you what they're saying. Oh, hell no. No, no, no. It's time for somebody to feel the pain that we're feeling. And so the reality is, I think it is important that uh, we stay reminded not to ask black people to do the work that they've been doing. It's time for white people to do that work. Sorry to be so frank, but you asked me to come. One of the things that white people have to do is make sure that we are making room in our lives for black people. You know, one of the stats, Chris, you might know this better than me, but there's a huge percentage of white people that don't have a close black friend that, that, you know, that we're not, we need to be breaking bread together. We need to be over each other's houses. We need to, to really build bonds of love um, across faith, across race, particularly across race. And one of the things we need to do, and I, and I said this before, I want to emphasize this again, is it cannot be uh, the white savior. It, it has to be the white partner and the white supporter helping our black brothers and sisters, because we are all brothers and sisters, helping them in their dreams and finding out. So when we, you know, as a philanthropist, working with the community and, and having the community lead the way. And that's something I've learned over the last several years is I come in with support but I don't come in with orders. <laughs> I say, what do you need? How can I help? How can I, and, and the, what, the term I like is, how can I, as a philanthropist, be the wind beneath your wings? And then one last thing I'll say, something that I've been really happy we did. There's something called an ETF. Uh, um, uh, ETF uh, is, uh, uh, forget what it's called, uh, a traded fund. Uh, there's one by the NAACP and we were one of the first supporters of this fund. I just wanna say that this fund looks for companies that have equitable treatment of black people. Do they have black people on their board and their management team? What are their policies like? Um, we, um, it's the exchange traded fund. Um, we invested in it and I just wanna say we've made a 70% return in three years, but you can put your money in everything you do in your investments, in your philanthropy, or even just in the products you buy. Is it a black owned company? In every way, shape or form, we need to not just say, hey, I like Black people, but show in everything you do that you're there. Steve, let me push on that as well, because you're my brother, true brother and friend. Um, the goal for white people should not just be to have a Black friend. Be a friend to the Black community. And the scripture says, a friend loveth at all times, and a brother is made for adversity. And so the reality is we have we have to do the work that goes beyond the words and not just do enough the status quo. Oh, I have a black friend because to, the truth is there's a little bit of racism in that statement all by itself. Uh, I appreciate, oh, go ahead, please. Oh, thank you. I'm going to uh, actually respond to the question that was asked um, more directly. Um, 
we so we just finished the high holy days uh today is actually uh, the third day the second full day of the um, festival of sukkot mine blew down this morning um but it will come back and the no the high holy days for jews are like uh christmas and easter in the christian world and i i and at least uh probably um both of the aids in the muslim world so that's when uh if folks are going to show up that's when we're going to see them but every every year uh, we begin with the morning the 15 morning blessings which are part of the liturgy every single day of the year which is basic uh blessings of blessing when i say blessing we're not blessing something we're blessing god in response to something that we experience in the world and so the morning blessings are a series of blessings for the simple acts of opening our eyes and getting out of our beds and putting our feet on the floor and having the floor and the earth still beneath us. And I always stop and say, you know, this is what we need. If we did this every day, we wouldn't need all this drama of the high holy days for us to do the right thing in the world. But I, I do feel like there's a way in which being reminded of our own of what we do have in our life and our the richness of our life to allow us to more easily look at the world and respond is a really big piece and i love the wisdom of the morning liturgy every day uh, the other thing i want to add is that there's a lot there's a lot of uh a lot of concern this year during the high holidays it's been such a hard year how can we like tell people what they need to be doing better and i thought nah i need to let my folks need to, they need to know what they could be doing better and i spoke specifically about the idea of jewish supremacy or jewish superiority and the way that we still carry that in the world um as as a way towards really bringing this open um this openness of b'selem elohim and the image of god so i think that is what i i feel like are ways that i need to help my community reach out um, from a place of feeling blessed um, in their own lives and um, having what to give. Thank you for that. Uh, in terms of the original question uh, related to spiritual exercises and such, uh, in the Islamic paradigm, and I'm sure this is consistent across the traditions, the, the fundamental problem uh, relates to attachment to the world and or focus on the self. And those are both essentially the same thing, different language, that my narcissism, the more narcissism I have, the less space I have to see everyone else. The more narcissism I have, the less space I have in my heart even to see the divine. And so the more narcissism I have, the more I'm going to be immersed in the world and the more I'm going to be focused on my own uh, pursuit of attainment of the world, which then means what's going to be uh, ignored will be matters of justice or what will be ignored will be matters of my neighbors and so so we even have teachings attributed to the prophet muhammad may peace be upon him that the neighbors have so many rights that he even thought that god was going to require us to put them in our inheritances but again if my focus is on the development of myself the uh, the the elevation of myself i'm not going to care about anything else and and so from the spiritual perspective that's exactly what has to happen yeah, thank you so much, Omer. Um, I, I'm gonna um, turn to a question that was posed to us in the chat, which I think uh, connects right on this thread. Um, it's from John Nielsen, and he asks a challenging question. Are we getting to the heart of the issue here? And um, wh where he wants to push us, um, and I think he's talking especially to white people, perhaps white Christians especially, is the need to ask the question, what's in it for me and for my community, my society, by continuing to relegate black folk to the margins? And my question, what I'm, um, I'm trying to draw out is, what do we find in our religious traditions, in our home communities, to always take me to that question? What's in it for me that I relegate black folk to the margins, right? Like um, I'm Catholic, um, I'm supposed to go to confession, reconciliation. Am I encouraged in that practice to be identifying the specific times and concrete ways in which I relegate 
others to the margins in my own interest. Um, so are, how, does, how do your home communities encourage people, encourage their membership? How do you in your home communities encourage the membership to think, what's in it for me? How am I building up my community and myself, my, my narcissistic entrance by relegating others to the margins? I suppose that is posed as more of a rhetorical question. Um, and I, I love some of the, um, like the offerings that we got, the morning blessings, like doing this specific daily practice, where does that take my mind and heart so that I can do, so I can be nourished to do the anti-racist work or challenged to do the anti-racist work. So I'll, I'll um, give a second to see if anybody has another answer to this question, or maybe it's just a rhetorical one, and then we can shift another direction if not. So oh, I didn't quite understand the question. How are is it? How are you being a narcissist, or how by 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 subjugating people and putting them in the margins? Is that the question? The question is kind of I'll I'll, I'll read it again. It's um, what's in it for me and for my society by continuing to relegate black folk to the margins? I, I'd like to answer that then. Sure. Um, nothing. Uh, the letter I wrote from the Universal House of Justice very clearly says that racism is a blight on all people. Um, but we hold on to many things. And so we, um, you, what I always say is that we're always holding a box of rocks, thinking it's valuable when we could exchange that box of rocks for a box of diamonds. So we hold on to racism um, because we think it's valuable. We hold on to racist ideals. We hold on to white supremacy because we think it's superior. It is far superior and far better for society not to be racist, far better for all of us, and particularly black people in many ways in terms of opportunities, but also white people. Um, if you look at the movie 12 Years a Slave, which was a brutal movie, um, I thought it showed the, the terrible effects of racism on both whites and blacks. Uh, myself, I come from uh, a family where 19 members of my family were killed in the Holocaust. And, and people say, well, that's terrible. And I say, yes, it is. However, I am happy only for one thing is that I'm on that side of the coin. And even as a white person, it hurts me every day to think, and I'm sure I do, things uh, that are racist, that are, that are, you know, that, you know, without even thinking about it, just little things. I work every day not to do this, but, you know, I, it, 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 this is one of the reasons why I think we don't deal with racism is because it's too painful for white people to admit that we have a problem. We have to admit that we have a problem. We have to admit that this is a big problem and we have to work on it. Um, one of the things that the Baha'i writings say and that the, this letter says from the House of Justice is that no one, we have to do this with love and no one can be made to feel like the other and we can't do it with conflict and contention. And so it's not that we need to attack white people. We need to address the fact that white people have privilege. We need to address that there's white supremacy. We need to address these things. Um, and so it's, it's absolutely not to anyone's advantage. Racism is a blight on all of humanity. We just need to be really made aware of, we need to have our eyes open to that because we don't think about that enough. Uh, Rabbi, were you about to say something that I wanted to, yeah, um, go ahead. I'll wait. Okay. So I just want to give a shot at responding to the question with the assumption I accurately understood it. <laughs> so let me just start with that. What's in it for everybody uh, to address racism? You get to obey God. What's in it for everybody? you get to actually be a Christian. What's in it for everybody? You get to not upset and disobey God's law. What is that law? What are those laws? It's right there on your screen. First John chapter four, verse seven. My beloved friends, let us continue to love each other since love comes from God. Everyone who loves is born of God experiences a relationship with God. The person who refuses to love doesn't know the first thing about God because God is love. So you can't know him if you don't love. This is how God showed his love for us. God sent his only son into the world 
so we might live through him. This is the kind of love we're talking about. Not that we once upon a time loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice to clear away our sins and the damage we've done to our relationship with God. And then he goes on and on and on in that chapter. I would encourage everybody to read 1 John uh, chapter 4, uh, especially verses 7 and 8. The scripture is clear. If we don't love, the Bible says that we are not of God. So we got to decide if that is worth, right, us putting into work, putting, putting in the work. And I think the other side of that is, you know, when we think about what's in it, and these conversations really get uncomfortable um, for a lot of us, right? Because people really don't want to talk about it. But but we have to get, you know, strong enough and courageous enough to at least have the conversation or we will continue to ignore the issue, thus rendering the problem never getting solved. In the interest of getting to the real heart of the issue, the, the discomfort that you're talking about, uh, Pastor Chris, I'm going to invite John to unmute and to speak his question. Um, right, because I think he's trying to move past like the God doesn't want this, but to really have us and us uh, white people reckon with what is in it for me? What race? It, how does racism benefit me? And it does. Okay, John, have you been unmuted? Yes, I have. Thank you. Um, for me, James Baldwin remains the prophet that we most need at this particular time. And I don't know how many of you have seen this or read the book. The book is entitled, I Am Not Your Negro. The film is entitled, I Am Not Your Negro. That is not yes. what Baldwin says. Baldwin says, I'm quoting roughly, I'm not a nigger. I'm a man, and you have to figure out why you need the nigger. That is to say, you as a society have to figure out why you psychologically need this, okay? That, I mean, we can talk about various uh, spiritual practices and prayers and that sort of thing, but until that question, until we ask that question, until we as a, as a society and as each as individuals, white people ask that question, we're not going to get to the heart of what it's all about. We're not going to be able to make the kinds of connections that our tradition is urging us to make. Thanks for the time. I'll, uh, I'll mute myself again. Thank, thank you, John, for your courage. Uh, first of all, for your courage of asking the question, um, for your real, real, real serious courage of saying that word. Uh, <laughs> and I, I think the challenge here, let me tell you, the United States needed the Black man to build this country that we no longer benefit from, that we never have benefited from. Uh, they need the black man for prison, right? To continue to get free labor, modern day slavery, right? And there are so many other things um, it, that I could say with the challenge, but we would literally be another hour just on this one particular question. Um, and I would shift the question. After we really exhaust the conversation, why does not white America value the black man, the black person, right? And, and the truth of the matter is there are still policies in place and white people have not gotten courageous enough to fight against a policy that say black people are not even completely human. Like how do you, how do you stay quiet when it comes to something like that, right? And yes, I am triggered, so let me just tell you, right? And, and let's, let's add even beyond that. Why do we learn about the Holocaust every single year? But the people who want us to learn about the Holocaust are not raising their voice constantly saying, also let them learn about slavery, right? Why do, why do we have to watch the Ten Commandments every year, right? But nobody's saying, make them watch Roots as well, right? But we, we love ignorance because information and light, because when you look at scripture, when it talks about darkness and light, darkness is ignorance. And then light 
is information. And it is convenient to remain ignorant because then you don't have to really do anything. And so I think we have a responsibility to ask why have the people who frankly speaking uh, have been a part of the foundation of the world, why are they not yet valued? And the reality is racism has its benefits for those who benefit from racism and inequality. Um, wow, yes. And uh, so I'm, I'm gonna jump in. The, um, I lived in Vermont, John and I lived in Vermont for years uh, before coming to Milwaukee and coming to the city on a lot of levels was really um, new. But back in Vermont, as the issues of racism really came up, I felt like, how do we deal with this here? It is lily white. I mean, we have intense socioeconomic divide, but not racial divide. So my husband came home um, with a book that I would call sort of the counterpart to Stamped from the Beginning to really talk about the, the ongoing um, issues of racism. And it was called, essentially called White Trash. And it talked about the classism within the white world. But then the really important thing was that the, and it really started, the story started with the debtors and the prisoners being sent over to the US. Some were sent to Australia as well from Britain and then in, from Britain. And what, what really allowed this, this low class of whites to continue was that well, there's folks below you. And so for hundreds and hundreds of years ago, this was set up as a, well, at least you're white and at least you're not a slave. Even if, even if you were a un, unpaid, you know, in some ways the same kind of indentured labor, but it was definitely created. Um, it has been painful for me uh, in the last years here in Wisconsin to see the glee about having the Holocaust education bill approved in our state government, while then also watching just in these last months as the idea of critical race theory as a, as a concept being said, but you can't teach about what really happened. So I feel like for many folks, Black History Month provided a way to talk about Black people, but not about real Black history. And it's disgusting what is happening right now. And I do believe people are speaking out about it and, and engaged because we, we, we get it. I think many people get it. Um, but especially, I mean, coming to like, what, what do Jews give up? I think for some folks, and I've already alluded to this, they give up their own sense of, but we're the oppressed ones. Like to let go of our own oppression um, and it's very, very generational and, and move forward to understand that the world changes when you are in a place of privilege or of power, um, privilege here in the US and around the world and power in, in Israel. It's almost like it's too soon and too fast and people don't know how to deal with it. And it's, it's, and it's a struggle for me because I, I get very frustrated with folks. It's like, look at the life you're now living but it's too soon. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I the, from the standpoint of what do we will, oh, and the other thing I do wanna say, at least from the standpoint of the 10 commandments, you know, there's some ways in which these Jewish stories are also Christian stories. So they're considered part of the, like part of our shared heritage, um, but it, 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 doesn't, it doesn't fix the problem, Chris. For sure. yeah, Just, yeah, they, they shouldn't, they, by the way, they should not, these things should not go away my point is we should be right advocating for the, the same thing when it comes to black history and black Absolutely. issues. Absolutely. The, the interjection that I want to make about this conversation is that what this illustrates, this not teaching of roots, but celebrating the Holocaust education unit or whatever, illustrates the interlocking of race and religion. Mikhail, you alluded to this, right? That, that Jews are accepted as white. In, in American culture. So it's the other we're, the Jews are the other we white Christians are comfortable with. Right. Right. Well, because, of course, that's the white, the white Jews. 
And of course, right. there are Jews, who, but which is really the majority, especially here in the U.S. Now, there's many more um, Middle Eastern Mizrahi Sephardic Jews, and there are some in in the U.S. as well. But once again, in the U.S., Jews are so used to being European Ashkenazi white Jews that, and that's where our internal racist issues come up too, um, in within the Jewish community and having to broaden our view. But um, but yes, yes, I just wanted and, to clarify that because not right. all, and we are having to work on our language because not all Jews are white. And we have to, internally, we're working on our own languaging. So to me, I think, I think this, there's an important interlocking between race and religion. And Americans or our college students or whomever our audience is need a better education about the ways in which racialized identities flow in and flow out of religious identities. Um, so a question I have, and, and this is a real live question, is what is the, what is the place of interreligious work in the project of racial justice? Like, do our interreligious dialogues, if you've been a part of these before, do they raise questions about race? Do we deal with racial categories in interreligious dialogues? Or are we still holding religion and race apart as though they're two separate categories? So, so I'll jump in and make the conversation even more complicated. So uh, theology often comes uh, second uh, to reinforce uh, a status quo. And then theologies are often created in response to those to then cause change. So for example, think of feminist theology as a response to, to mainstream theology, or think of black liberation theology as a response to liberation theology, which itself is a response to, to, to other theology and such. Uh, but I would say in terms of contemporary American religion, uh, it's still very myopic in the sense that it's limited to America. And so I made the point at the beginning that this is a global situation. And so we may not have official slavery in the United States, but we still have the 13th Amendment. And as Pastor Chris mentioned, we have this entire prison industrial complex. But chances are that the clothing that many of us are wearing right now, and I haven't even checked myself, so I may, just, I may be just as guilty as anyone, uh, is being made in sweatshops uh, uh, across the world. So I have students from Bangladesh who have cousins who work in sweatshops because they can't afford anything else, and they get paid the equivalent of one quarter a day to be making our clothing. And, and so what also happens in the, in the myopia of theology is even if we try to be inclusive, we still wind up uh, often embracing political lines. And so what I'm suggesting is that uh, as horrendous as the situation is a race in America, we can't separate it from what's happening globally because even our foreign policy has a vested interest in not seeing the people of color overseas as fully human, right? Their stats. I mean, the only time we care about, about the women of Afghanistan is with the Taliban's taking over. We literally did not care like six months ago. And so, so the point is that uh, whereas the plantations in our society were being used and human beings, African-Americans were being used to make the clothing for the rest of America, now this is taking place at a global level. I mean, a website I encourage everyone to take a look at is Slavery Footprint. And it's a very, they, they give you a very, very simple survey where you can take a look at how much forced labor was required for you to have your lifestyle. And I just did this a couple of days ago and I think it was 24 people. And, and so the point is that theology in itself will force a status quo, but then a counter theology will then be formed to respond to that. But even then I'm suggesting much American theology, much American discourse still has American exceptionalism built into it. You have made the conversation more complicated. Oh, I'm sorry, Chris, did you wanna go? <laughs> Yeah, I would just say, I think one of the most refreshing things for me has, you know, when it comes to healing, you know, I always say we don't really need people to helicopter and to save us. You know, you give black people the training, the tools and the resources, we're pretty resilient people. We'll save ourselves. However, I think things need to be owned by us, driven by us and led by us, but not just us. And I got to tell you, one of the most refreshing things over the last I can say 19 months is 
I have found many white people who care enough to get involved, who care enough to do something, who care enough to sit and say, educate me. And only a percentage of those have been able to successfully control their emotions and not get offended and chew on the truth that black people have been living and holding for 400 plus years. So what keeps me coming to conversations like this is I pray that I will find at least one or two who say, I wanna be a part of the solution after we have addressed the problem and then come into the community. Here's what I say to my Jewish friends all the time. Steve and I talk about this for all, and all my rabbinical friends. I say, listen, when it comes to the black Jewish relationship, I think I was born to help build relationship between our communities. I'm thoroughly convinced of that. But I always challenge my Jewish friends. Don't ask me to go to Israel, which is thousands of miles away. And I can't ask you to come on the south side of Chicago to Bronzeville. Because we always get together during Dr. King's birthday, link arms and say, we shall overcome. But here's the truth that I say to all my white friends and Loyola experts and students and community, we will not overcome until we come over into each other's community, learn about each other, get to the place where we love each other enough to do something about the challenges that we now know. Chris, I'll see you in Bronzeville on Saturday at our community Make celebration, uh, which is, uh, it is a community celebration and it's it's really specifically designed uh, to be a celebration with white and black people coming together and we're encouraging people. Um, I will try to find a flyer. Do you have a flyer you can post, Chris, for that? Do you want me to post it? Trying to grab it, keep going. Okay, so you can post a flyer anyway. If there's going to be about 30 local groups together, and it's a it's exactly that. So people can go to Bronzeville and see Bronzeville, you know, and I'll just say this because I heard this last night from somebody in one of our Baha'i study groups is she asked a policeman, the policeman said, you don't want to go there. Don't go there. You know, we're not responsible for protecting if you go there. And uh, she's not going. Uh, she, you know, I, I, I had a little counterpoint to that saying that I've been there many times and, and I've never, ever feared for my life. Um, you know, we have to come to each other's communities. We have to go out there and we have to get to know each other and we can't be afraid. And uh, we, have, we, have to, we have to be in each other's, as I said, in each other's houses and we have to be willing to help. Um, I wanna say uh, one other thing and that is we have to be anxiously concerned with the needs of rage. This is from Baha'u'llah, I'm paraphrasing him. And he also says, justice is the best beloved of all things in, in my sight, meaning God's sight. The number one thing that we need in this age is unity between Christian and Muslim and Jew and, and Baha'i and atheist as well, and black, white, brown, all colors. We need unity. And part of what we need is we need to join together as one family. We cannot do that when some members of our family are, are not allowed to live. Imagine, you know, Chris and I have called each other brothers in the course of this conversation, and he is my brother, and we're friends. Um, but imagine my brother, not, this is not imagination, this is reality. My brother doesn't have everything I have. He is my brother. We are brothers. We have to, and we can't get it just in our heads. We need to get it in our hearts. That's how religion can help. And that's how all of our religions can help. All of our religions, as, as you, all of the three of you have so eloquently said, tell us this and the Baha'i faith as well. We are one human family, but we need to feel this in our hearts and we need to put it in all of our hearts, no matter what religion we follow. Thank you for sharing the um, poster um, for the Bronzeville um, Community Celebration Day. And I, I guess I want to conclude our conversation in the last couple of minutes here on that note. 
um, about like, what are the concrete things that people can engage in? I would say that that basically captures the majority of the questions that I've received um, in the chat and that were sent ahead of time. Like, what do I do as an individual person of faith? Um, how do I find um, these conversation circles in my home community, in my Catholic home parish? Um, what are, what is happening in different religious communities or different churches? So you all panelists are leaders in one way or another in your communities. Um, you've mentioned a couple of things as we've gone on, like become educated, learn, hear a book to read, hear documentaries to watch. But I'd also like to ask you to just uh, maybe speak about things that you have participated in, um, activities or events that you participated in that have uh, that have educated you, that have you taken you to a different part of your community, um, that have gotten you thinking about these, or engaged in active um, works of mercy toward racial reconciliation. So I think any ideas that people have, the audience would be happy to hear them. So let me just again start by saying thank you for uh, including me uh, in this conversation. It has been truly enjoyable. And I mean, the truth of the matter is uh, having these esteemed colleagues to have this very sensitive uh, conversation with has been quite delightful and informative for me. So thank you um, to my fellow panelists. Uh, one of the things that people can do, I'm putting it in the chat. Uh, there's an email address and our number email us and just say, simply say, I was on, I, I tuned in and I want to get involved, right? Uh, because getting informed, getting inspired, and then getting informed is the thing. This is not the platform where we can share how you can get involved. Uh, but if you email, uh, we'll set up a meeting and have a conversation. Again, it doesn't have to be all of the, uh, how many hundreds of people that were on here today or will watch this in the future. But if we find a few people, right? Uh, the guy that I preach and teach about, Jesus, he recruited a team of 12 <laughs> and turned the world upside down. Listen, Gideon, right? He had a big army, but he had victory with the smaller number. And all we're looking for are the few that are willing and ready to get involved. So thanks for today. Uh, and I've really been blessed today. So of course I am not in the Chicago area, um, but I can't imagine that uh, everything that is available and accessible here in Milwaukee is not available and accessible in Chicago in space. Um, there are a number of um, organizations that uh, our faith communities directly are a part of um, that work to address the issues in our inner city, which is a you know a euphemism for in our. Uh, minority communities. Um, one thing that I, I think has not been addressed that I feel like is challenge can be challenging and is relevant for our faith communities is that a lot of these issues end up getting addressed in political realms. Um, issues of you know, tr public transportation, issue of funding of education. Um, Know, mostly on the city level, but here in uh, Wisconsin, I don't think it's very different than it is in Illinois. You know, the needs of the, the big cities go works in opposition to the needs of the rest of the mostly rural states. Um, so a willingness to find out what those issues are that the leadership of the communities of color are, are addressing and those organizations are addressing and independently saying, this is an issue that we're gonna take on politically because this is important. And that's a real strong voice that we have um, that we can use in parallel support. So that's just a whole other realm, but it's like that P word that some religious folks are afraid to address. Um, but it is one way that power is also a, a capital P word. And that is one way we can use our power. And forgive me, I forgot to just at least briefly mention you know, what is that work, right? Through Bright Star Community Outreach, not just the church, but um, the work that we do, we brought a model uh, to address trauma uh, from Israel. Really, really excited about that work. Uh, we've touched more than 45,000 people with trauma counseling through faith and community leaders, uh, especially those in Chicago um, and beyond. And then now Steve and I are working really hard uh, to build up this new effort 
uh, that has already been done in other areas that Steve has supported in workforce development, taking people from community to opportunity and through a portal of uh, various uh, trainings for nine to 12 months that will allow them to get the skills that they need. And then also conversations and collaboration around health, housing, and education. So that's the work and we welcome everybody. So uh, I would say go talk to Pastor Chris. Uh, otherwise, the only other thing I would add is that uh, if we speak in five-year terms, 10-year terms, and 100-year terms, the five-year terms would be to, to focus on education, like the reading list that were shared. The 10-year term would be to focus on your own institution building, either to expand what is already there or to figure out what, what niches still can be fulfilled. And in the 100-year, it's to figure out how to dismantle this global system. Thank you so much, Omar. I think that, that is a really wise way to end. Um, it's concrete, it's specific, um, and it's also um, feels more manageable than, than some of the hard conversations that we've had today. Um, I will conclude us, our, our time is up, and unless Mike needs to draw it to a close, I will just by saying thank you so much for all the people who joined us and listened and wrote in the chat. And um, thank you, especially Steve, Omar, Mikhail, and Chris, uh, it was a wonderful afternoon event and um, I feel fired up and I hope everybody else does as well. I'll just say thank you, uh, just to, to uh, not be the last voice, but we are finished. Everybody, we'll see you online. We're gonna integrate these resources that you've shared with us uh, and put them in the landing page and, maybe, and then email maybe our Zoom registrants so they have the information about Saturday's event in Bronzeville and the Baha'i resources, uh, Pastor Chris, your, your list. We have a, a really good, strong Catholic Christian anti-racism list on the Hank Center. Um, yeah, I was gonna say this, but it, I just, you know, the Ignatian spirituality, a major core sign of it is to be a contemplative, a contemplative in action. And, you know, you give us a lot to contemplate, but then where's the action? You know, so we want that dialogue. And I thought of Gil Scott Heron, um, you know, uh, you know, every, you know no, nobody can do everything, right? But everybody can do something. And uh, I think if we can think about it that way, Chris, you were talking about compassion fatigue. So I think if you make a, a step out of that, then we can do something. Uh, and a little building blocks in this can really help. So um, I'm, I'm, all, I'm all in and I'm ready myself to, to be educated. And I know so many of our people at Loyola are. So I wanna thank you for nourishing us again and we'll see you all online. Peace. Thanks Mara too. Thanks everybody, take care. Mike, I sent you a DM.